totally a good investment. What I said earlier was that effectively Adam is going to be the one who answers this question for us, not me. And in order to do that, I'm going to line him up very nicely. Um, most of the common challenges, at least from my personal perspective, when I was starting property that I faced surrounded or, or um, were around a couple of these things, but research is always a problem. Where, where do you invest? Do you invest close to home? How do you know enough or learn enough about the areas that you are investing in? Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at some of these messages. We can only see my hair. Oh, sorry, you shouldn't really be seeing me. I should be presenting. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, so some of, a lot of the challenges around um, the areas that you're looking for. Once you find an area, it can be a bit analysis paralysis. Do you go, do you stop, do you, you know. Once you've actually bought the property, actually, most of the challenges really start. You have um, the pieces around things like the, the property management itself, which is a huge challenge. Um, in cash flow, any property investor will tell you that cash flow is the most difficult thing in the world. Or at least that's what I find, but maybe Adam will tell us different. So I think I would love it, and I'm sure he will, if Adam touches on a couple of these things, particularly the piece around management. We often hear and people talk a lot about buying, but not necessarily about the ownership phase of it. When it comes to actually purchasing, um, some of the important bits to remember around how, you know, you're going to use debt, are you going to use equity? What is equity? So as we talk about the true cost of a deal, a bit of a lot of this will come out um, later on in the presentation. But it's important to understand, and I want to just level set with some of this terminology that we are going to be describing later on. Um, we're talking about things like the debt versus equity conundrum. If you're going to purchase an asset, how much of that? What's the correct proportion of debt to use versus equity based on whatever weighted average calculation? So debt versus equity and leverage. Leverage is always very important as well. Um, the key thing to understand is that leverage, the financial leverage component, what that represents and the interest payments and the effect of leverage on returns. So we will talk a bit about that later on as well. And I think on that note, um, I will look for Mr. Lawrence here and I will activate him. As you on. get yourself ready, Adam, if you could unmute yourself. But um, one of the other elements that I want to touch on is cash flow. So a lot of the challenges around cash flow come from um, the, I guess, Rod will go through this in the last stage. And it's the, the true cost, yeah, let's call it that. A lot of the costs of property investment get uh, swept up under mm -hmm. the rug. Like people will talk to you, and this is an example. I think it's from today, maybe yesterday, that I pulled off the internet around what people look at and what people consider when they are effectively looking at cash flow. Rent, mortgage, the management costs. I mean. Yeah, as I say, Rod would go through this in a lot of detail, but the costs associated are a lot, lot more um, than most of what's been shown here. Mm -hmm. So, on that note, um, let me go for this again. I think, Adam, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Um, just going to quickly go through a very quick intro. Um, I've bought 250 odd properties in the last nine years so i've approached the investment angle from the point of view that i think low cost high yielding properties are really robust really good um relatively not easy but it, it's it's doable to buy them at the right sort of prices but they don't return a lot of money in their singularity so in order to make a real go of it and build a business around it, um, you've really got to buy in significant volume, which is what I've tried to do. So what the four pillars does is it puts together um, effectively a strategic framework. Um, so it's something for us all to consider 
hopefully for for property in general so I, I i put this together on the back of basically observations that i made and i found it useful to structure my thinking into a kind of strategic framework like this and every time i have a problem i look at um the framework um, it's helped me to also forecast where i might have problems in the future so effectively i split them into four types which four parts four pillars which are the supply pipeline so where you get the deals from the financial structure, which I know Rod is going to talk a lot more about, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there tonight. Um, the refurbishment stage or optimization, if you prefer, because it's not always just about refurbishment. It's about making it into the best product it can be. Um, and then, as Quasi said there, the ongoing management, which is a big bugbear of mine because people tend to miss out on that stuff, I think, and uh, that's not the way to do it. So we'll skip over the intro and get straight involved in the supply pipeline. Um, so... I, I tend to present this as there are easy ways and there are hard ways. Generally speaking, I think there are three of these seven points here that are accessible to all of us um, at whatever point in, in the journey we are, if you like. So one of those is estate agents. Um, the second one is auctions. And then the third are sources, which are the kind of industry or cottage industry that you don't necessarily know exists before you start going to a lot of property meetings. So estate agents... Uh, pretty much where everybody else, where everybody starts off, I think, really accessible. Um, do the vast majority of transactions in the UK, over 90% of the transactions. Um, certainly where I started off and bought my first half a dozen or so through agents in the old school way, pounded the ground, um, built the relationships with the agents, went with a clear proposition, tried to be someone who was credible um, and managed to buy, as I say, first half a dozen, which all turned out to be pretty reasonable purchases and have served me well over time so didn't do too badly there second one is auctions which is certainly a whole presentation in itself um Kwesi mentioned there in, in his in his intro about some of the some of the challenges you have in property and decision making is definitely one of them and auctions can be quite a risky arena you know it's it, the perfect storm is there to try and make you make bad decisions. The auction in itself tries to make you make bad decisions. It does things quickly. The auctioneer creates a bit of hype. They try and drive you into doing things you wouldn't necessarily do if you had five minutes to make a decision. Um, so it's about being disciplined. It's about doing your research. But there's loads and loads of good stuff that trades at auction. It really represents you know, the trade price rather than the retail price, which tends to be what you get through an estate agency and then sources. So I have used sources is a really broad term. I should say it can be someone who's been on a one day course and has decided they're going to find property for people um, as a living um, all the way through to people who trade tens, dozens, sometimes hundreds of properties a month um, by buying them direct to vendor. So I, I came to a, a realization that I didn't want to be a sourcer per se, although we, we do these days have, um, a company that, that focuses on buying from auction, very much so. But I would rather let the traders spend the big bucks on the marketing that needs to be spent to do this sourcing of properties and try to buy direct from those traders. So by forming relationships with them, by being able to do wholesale deals with them, by going to them and saying, look, I can buy 50 properties off you if you can deliver X or Y. Um, from the trader's perspective, why would they let me have it cheap? Because they know they're going to get their money very quickly. So that's something that's worked really well for me. Um, and then on the on the more sophisticated side that I wouldn't recommend for sort of newbies, direct to vendor. So that's the other side of what I was just talking about, literally going out, prospecting, marketing, um, usually the war that's waged on the internet these days in terms of how much money you're willing to pay for a click. Uh, it's not the, not the way that I've chosen to do battle, if you will. Much more of a trading business approach to um, the whole piece rather than an investment mindset, which is where I tend to, to gravitate towards joint ventures i put on the on the experience side as well um primarily because i think they are generally not done very well people don't protect themselves very well people are very quick to sometimes get into bed with the wrong people and they need to be very very cautious about that uh direct from receivers that can be um a particularly lucrative route if those relationships can be formed but of course receivers do have to be seen to be getting the best price from the market so sometimes that relationship can be best if looking at deals that are pre-packaged or pre-receivership rather than once the insolvency practitioners have got involved. Um, but sometimes there's a deal to be done, particularly in times like uh, 
a recessionary environment when something might have been shown to the market and they want to move something on um, relatively quickly. They've tried once or twice at auction. They know they've done their bit in terms of it's seen the market, so they know someone who will do what they say they're going to do and give them a price and complete the deal. And sometimes that's where the receivers get to or the asset managers get to with a property sale. Um, and then portfolios are often seen probably as the holy grail. Can you buy big portfolios all the time at massive discounts? Not in my experience, no, but it is possible to buy them discounted, um, particularly when the vendors got themselves into the right mindset or they're motivated in the right way. Most, vast, vast majority of them might as well just sit on right move because they want top dollar for properties that are creaking, um, need lots and lots of work, and ultimately there isn't really a case there. They'll, they'll happily tell you about how they were refurbed 12 years ago, which basically means they need another refurbishment at any point in the near future. So without... Without the supply, I don't think you can you can't get started realistically, and that's the point. But if we could go on, Quasi, to uh, to the next slide, um, that's around the financial structure. So, very simplistically, as I say, I know Rod's going to go into detail. You're looking at effectively what have you got? What what's available to you now? Well, your money now is available to you. Um, the bank's money is also available to you, and you don't necessarily need to be that sophisticated or experienced to get hold of it. So that might be simple as uh, a basic mortgage. Um, it might be loans to um, put down deposits. It might be loans based on other commercial businesses or enterprises you're involved in that you want to use for property. At the moment, it might be loans from the coronavirus um, business interruption loan scheme or from the small business scheme, but that's a, a slight aside there, really. And the other one that is on there um, that I think is available to, to people is, um, is the vendor's assets. And what I mean by that is effectively rent to rent. So it's often done, it's often seen as the only way in for people who haven't got much in terms of assets to deploy straight away. Um, and it seems that, that landlords, or property owners are willing to um, lease those assets out to people who are then going to sweat them a little harder than the landlord did. So the typical model is to try and pay a bit below the market rent and then put in um, an HMO or a piece of serviced accommodation on the top of that. So effectively adding value by having an operating company sitting on top of that. Um, it's not something that I've ever particularly considered going into. If I did, I would, I, I'm much more of a landlord who would grant rent to rent to people. Indeed, I've done that in the past and I still do that. Um, but I, I see it as uh, it gives you some of the pie, but I'm not looking for the operating company piece to add the value. I'm looking for the inherent asset in the investment to add the value. So I want to go to sleep and wake up in the morning uh, and be a little bit little bit better off on paper than I was the day before. Um, and with rent to rent, ultimately, if you're sweating my asset, it's me who's getting richer. Now, if you've got an option in there and there's an option interwoven, that can give a bit of the best of both worlds. So can be done fraught with um, compliance issues usually. But I do know several people who do do it really, really well and they actually stand out by making sure they, they cover all the compliance concerns. So it's, a, it's a, a legitimate business model that a lot of housing associations and big big corporates use. They just don't want to necessarily own the assets. They just want to operate the assets. Very similar to the way a hotel works, effectively. A hotel is quite often done on what we would call as property investors, a rent-to-rent -rent basis. Um, and then on the more complex stuff, other people's money fits over there for me because I think you've got to be sophisticated and you've got to have a duty to know what you're doing before you're getting involved with other people's money. My money tomorrow, that refers to a, a sort of pipeline style strategy that I use in terms of bringing money that I know is coming in in the future, whether that be three months, six months, 12 months or further, and borrowing against that, knowing that I will be able to repay those loans at a point in the future. Not dissimilar to the way that um, a building society will run its, its lending and borrowing pipeline. It's very much the model that I've appropriated to use in my property businesses. Um, and then bridges, I like to put bridges on the sophisticated side because they're very sophisticated, hard-nosed characters who won't worry about calling in the LPAs if that's what they need to do and repossessing a property that they've lent you money on. So you need to be very careful before you're getting too involved with, um, with bridging finance. But for me, it was a big step change when I got my head around bridging finance and gain the confidence, and that's what enabled me to do as many deals as I've done, or it was one of one of the things that enabled me to do as many deals as I've done. And then the other one there, the vendor's money, so it's slightly different from the vendor's assets, because what I'm saying there is, ultimately, you can use the vendor's, um, to, uh, in a vendor finance deal, 
it may well be the case that the vendor puts the deposit down for you. Um, it's not uncommon in commercial property transactions, and it does happen in some resi transactions as well. So all about the motivation of the vendor. Why do they want to sell it? When do they need the money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, not something you're going to pick up and do straight away. But if we go on to um, the next slide there, Kwesi, the management slide. Um, so management, as I say, I think it's vastly underrepresented. And I think Kwesi picked it up there as one of his big four challenges that there are in property. And I strongly, strongly agree with it. Um, this is really born from the fact that time and again, I was seeing portfolios come across my table. Um, they weren't correctly priced or discounted and there wasn't really motivation to let them go. But when I did an initial conversation or, or did some initial due diligence, what I saw coming up again and again and again is that these landlords were not managing their assets properly. And it was just a real, it was a real surprise to me. I just thought, why is this happening over and over again? Um, there's a lot of, I suppose, distrust between the traditional landlord and the traditional letting agent on both sides, realistically. Um, whereas actually a good agent can be a, a fantastic asset. Um, and so I, that, that's one of the things that got me involved in agency and starting to um, learn and train how to be an agent and buying into letting in estate agencies as well. So top one there, that stands for uh, do it yourself, do it your freaking self. Um, did you not learn the last time? So doing it yourself when it comes to things like refurbishment, I'm, I'm, I'm largely against because there's no scale. Um, there's no leverage. Um, it's not a business, it's a hobby. If you want to do that, that's fine. More power to you, but it's not for me. Um, and it's not. It, it, it's just not a scalable thing. Um, same goes for management. I don't know why you, you would you would manage your own. Um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. If you need to, because the margins aren't there, then the margins aren't there and it wasn't an investment that's worth doing in the first place anyway. Um, so available to anybody, but yeah, don't do it, please. Letting agents, as I say, they're available to anyone. I think from my experience, what I would say to people is, Take it really, really seriously. Um, a good letting agent can supply you with deals, so they can supply you with stock, and they're happy to do so. They don't want to buy property. They want to manage property. They've got an operating business. You've got an investment business. The right sort of letting agent can work perfectly. You also get letting agents who've got portfolios who've bought 10, 20, 40, um, but bought them pre-2008 when the financing structure and rules were very different. They've sat on their portfolio, and they're happy these days to – sit where they are they've got enough on paper in terms of wealth they don't want to take on new debt they don't want to expand their portfolio but they're more than happy to help the right sort of landlords expand theirs and i've worked with a few people like that i would say take it as seriously as you take anything in property go interview people have a backup for that person as well don't put all your eggs in one basket um it really really basic stuff but you should be treating that as as seriously as you would treat a job interview whether you were the recruiter or whether you were um, the prospective employee. And it's something that people just don't talk enough about and don't have a structure around, which I think is really, really silly. And then friends and family, that's the other one that's available to everyone. But again, I would say, why, why would you do that? The only, all of the worst compliance cock-ups I've ever heard of have always been, oh, my brother looks after these properties, or as it turns out, my brother doesn't look after these properties because he doesn't know what he's doing. So as, as we go on through um, more and more compliance, fitness for human habitation, everything else that's going on, um, there's absolutely no way that you can you can really work with with friends and family. And then, Quasi, do you just want to go back a second and I'll just finish off the, the more sophisticated bits of the management back a slide up. Yeah. And then up there, I've also put the, the portfolio manager and the business manager. So that's for the people with the bigger portfolio. So 50 plus is probably in terms of units where you start thinking about whether you've got, um, rather than just having some admin support, which is normally your first, um, your first hire, do you need, do you want a portfolio manager, someone who can be a second line of defense to you so they can stop the problems and make sure you are truly able to, to go on holiday leave for a month come back and nothing's gone wrong with the business and also someone who can help you understand and expand the business as well um business manager a slightly broader remit who may well be helping you out with any operational companies you've got as well on top of uh, just the pro investment properties so someone with some overall general business skills generally speaking and then i put the hmo specialist agent on the um on the sophisticated side as well because there aren't many of them um London, different market, different kettle of fish. There are a number of people who, who really know what they're doing in the HMO world. Um, but as you go out into the provinces, 
you can quite often have areas where there are there are one or no HMO specialist agents. And I think if you aren't dealing with someone who really knows this stuff around HMO, that's a problem. And I would always have, again, um, someone and then also a backup lined up if I was going to invest in any HMOs anywhere. Um, and then obviously that position there, the business owner, that looks different to different people. For some of us, um, they'll never leave the office and they love the thrill of the chase and they want to do every single acquisition. Some of us a bit more like me would rather be on a bit on the periphery in terms of maybe making the final decisions, but on a more consultative role and a more supportive role, bringing other people forward in the business to try and allow them. So it gives me options, not that I really want to walk away from the business at any point. It's not in my plans. Um, some people just want to get to the beach as quickly as they can. And if they do, then then more power to them. Um, so if you want to go forward, Quasi, I'll talk about a couple of the um, – couple of the takeaways that I like to, to try and leave people with and then we'll get on to Rod. Um, so what what's uh, slide slightly corrupted there, unfortunately. What I normally talk about here is um, I'm a big fan of – I saw a great great post the other day about of Warren Buffett's top 25 quotes. Probably the most pertinent ones at the moment as we, as we record this are um, when the tide goes out, you get to see who's swimming naked. Um, and I also think um, be greedy when others are fearful. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you should be going mad over extending yourself buying properties today, but it'd be a good idea to watch when the sentiment in the broader marketplace hits its bottom. Um, and when it hits its bottom, that is absolutely when you should be looking to buy and being what you should be doing at the moment, in my view, is making sure you're in a position to buy and looking for people who are already writing off gigantic discounts on properties before we really know where this whole thing is going to settle down. Um, it's always, if you ask Warren Buffett, when's a good time to look at the fundamentals of a, a business he's going to invest in, he'll tell you it's every day. Um, there's no days not to look at what's what's relevant. And fundamentals are always good, whether it's 2009, 2020, um, or in the middle of a boom. And it's also what stops you buying at the top of a market when you look at it that way. So uh, I shall leave it there so we can get on to Rod. And, this, uh, and we'll, I, I take it, Quasi, we're going to answer all questions in the Q and A, or do you want me to do a couple of minutes now? Um, I think we'll take them. We'll take the questions in the Q and A. Um, okay. But thank you. I wanted to take the presentation off just so everyone can see who is doing that great talking. Thank you very much for that, Adam. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rod, Rod is an awesome guy really detail oriented when it comes to the property stuff which is why i thoroughly enjoy listening to him talk about it and as i said as i showed earlier the post where they talk about cash flow and i think there were three things in that calculation all i'm going to say about that is over to you rod <laughs> thank you um hopefully everyone can hear me i'm not sure if quasi i'm guessing you're going to do the uh the slides yep um, just say next slide and I'll move it and everyone can hear you. Okay, so yeah, um, I mean, very brief uh, bit about me is my, my background's actually been in development. So I started in development and then moved more over into the investment side, um, I suppose once I've probably built up a bit of a pot of capital. Um, so yeah, I mean, I host a uh, podcast called The Rodcast, which is all about asset-backed investments. So you can get to kind of hear a bit more about what I've done and uh, what I'm what I'm interested in. Um, I'll, I'll put a link up of that later. But yeah, let's get cracking, Quasi. So if you want to jump onto the next slide, um, what I want to talk about today is, as Adam kind of mentioned, there's a lot of people in these property circles. Um, when you start to get into investing in property or being involved in it in any way, um, and a lot of them are. are motivated by your decision to part with money um, and that is a really really important thing for you to remember when you're dealing with any professionals whether it's estate agents whether it's solicitors whether it's um, even accountants uh, your decision to maybe buy a property may affect them financially so um, some things just to bear in mind is to be I'm quite cynical at the best of times but just to understand your numbers inside out um, understand what it is that you're buying is so, so important. So some of the things that I'll always look at 
well, how long is this investment for? So am I buying a property to trade? Am I buying it to develop? Uh, is the development going to take two years? Will selling it take another six months? Um, maybe understand what that annualized return will be. Or am I buying this to hold maybe for 20 years until I retire? And when I retire, am I going to be selling it? Or am I going to maybe be leaving it to my kids? So all these things are really important because how long you get the, you buy the investment for and how long you're in that investment is going to be very, very critical as to how it's run, how it's operated and what kind of returns you're going to be looking for and what's important for you at the front end when you're purchasing it. You've obviously got huge amounts of different types of property investments. Um, you've got you can diversify your investments in property through location. So obviously a property in Aberdeen versus a property in London will be different. You can diversify through tenant type. So that could be um, underwritten by the government through social housing, or it could be young professionals or blue collar workers. That's just in residential in, in um, commercial. You've got all sorts of different types from blue chip to independence to mom and pops and various other things. So understanding those things are important, but also then the use class. So what type of property is it? In residential, there's a few as well. One of the things about HMOs, I think Adam Adam touched on a few, few things about management, which is massive. Um, if you're competing at the high end of the young professional market, um, what tends to happen is they hurt after three years. So for the first three years, they're great. But then you realize um, as time goes on that younger people want more from the product and you're competing at a top end and it's a race to the top. It's a race to give the best product. So that can often mean a lot more turnover of tenant and it can often mean a lot more ma management and maintenance as well. When you're looking for investments, I always want to look at the reward versus the risk but in addition to the risk the effort okay this is direct property investing we're not indirectly investing into funds we are investing into things that we have control over so not only are we asset allocators we are also asset managers to a point even if we've got a letting or management agent we're still managing the manager so it's direct investment which is really really key and with that comes a lot of effort and remember, if you've got to increase your uh, your returns, normally either risk or effort or possibly both has to be increased. OK, so with direct investing, often effort is the one people will choose. And then we've got to look at investments through the true cost. So looking at it after tax, because what we want to know is what we get in our pocket at the end of the day that's what's important to us okay it's not what we show on a balance sheet it's what we get in our in our pocket so i quite like to um compare these to uh isa investments things like that anything that is tax-free uh income because once you've got the tax once you've taken that out what are you left with and then How can you, you um, structure your investments, what you put into them and, and various things like that? Um, so again, in planning for your current situation versus where you think you're going to be in 5, 10, 20 years. And like we said, your final exit or your legacy, what is it you're, you're actually, um, your, what, what are you investing for? Is it for your retirement? Is it to live on as income to get out of a job? Or is it maybe to leave your kids something? And also just understanding that period of time and what losses over the long term uh, there are going to be too. Uh, Kwesi, do you want to um, hit the next slide then? Great. So something I like to always look at is um, understanding kind of trying to have a holistic view of a portfolio almost. Um, so when I'm looking at an investment, I might look at something that on the headline figures might yield 10%. And what I've got to look at is, right, what would I prefer to have? 10 properties yielding 10%, but that 10% only being £200 of income a month. Or would I rather one property that yields 7%, but that's £2,000 of income per month? And it's, it's looking at this and understanding what is right for you. There is no right way of investing in property. There's a couple of wrong ways, but there's no right way. And what 
is really hard when you're starting out is you might hear someone who does something specific in property and you might think, God, they, they've made a real success to that. That sounds fantastic. I'm going to give that a go. Uh, and the next week you hear someone else who's doing something completely different, but they've been really successful at it. And you think, God, I might, I might do that. And you start to get this shiny penny syndrome and it's, and it's very difficult to focus. And that is one of the, one of the biggest difficulties. So from the outset, it's understanding what it is that you want from your property investments. Um, how much effort are you going to put in? Obviously, having 10 properties is likely going to be more effort um, and more operational costs. So that could decrease the net return through operational costs versus one property. But then one property, if there's an issue at that property, you've got all your eggs in one basket. So it's understanding what your kind of risk nature is. Um, <clears throat> so again, looking at rental values are key. Don't just look at the percentage return. Look at what that rental value is, okay? And the rental value is key because things like maintenance, voids, sunk costs as a percentage of rent roll, these all make a big impact. So if, for example, I've got a, um, a one-bed flat in Northumberland and I've got a one-bed flat in Mayfair <coughs> and uh, I've got to replace a bedroom door, it, it might cost me a slightly fractional bit more in Mayfair for labour than it is in Northumberland but really the cost of the door is going to be about the same so as a percentage of my rent in Northumberland that could be 40% of my rent whereas in Mayfair it might be half a percent so it's understanding all these operational costs as a percentage of your rent roll and how they will change over time and how they will affect your net returns over time because it's not just the first year that we care about unless we know we're going to sell that property in the first year. It's the lifetime of that property. So it's understanding value of deposits as well and what that brings. So, for example, the uh, max amount, amount of uh, deposit on a residential um, that's, I think, under 50 grand rent a year. Uh, you might need to check that, but that's five weeks. So five weeks of um, a deposit in London will be a much higher value than five-week deposit in, I won't choose Northumberland again, we'll give it know, Aberdeen or something like that. Um, and so what that means is actually that person is losing or giving up a higher proportion of, of money that it's going to take them to earn back at a later date. And that often, and this is a very broad brush example, but that can often mean that people tend to look after the property because they've got a little bit more to lose if uh, if things go wrong and they've got damage and uh, and things to pay at the end. So understanding all these things, often you'll you'll find people trying to sell you properties in the arse end of nowhere, and uh, there'll be high yields, and there's a quite a good reason why there's high yields for that. It's understanding how many uh, how many jobs as well and roles are required to manage that amount of assets. So again, like Adam pointed out earlier managing these assets is such a key thing. It's a huge, huge, huge cost. Um, and then one thing I really like to do is understand how you're personally going to fit into this investment business. And it absolutely is a business. So are you going to be the managing director or are you going to be the shareholder? And there's a massive difference between both of those roles. So and there's nothing wrong with either of them, but there's a difference and it's about understanding the difference. So being a managing director of something, a managing director is a high pressure, high stress job with a lot of, uh, of demands. They are leading, they are running from the front and they are operational. Okay. Whereas a shareholder is not. A shareholder is looking at something with the overview uh, of that whole company and guiding it down a route. And now there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a managing director of something. And there's nothing wrong or right with being a shareholder of something. But where it goes wrong is where people think they're the shareholder of something, but they uh, are in fact should be the manager and vice versa. So it's important to understand what it is and what roles you're going to take up as being that managing director or being the shareholder. So for someone like me, who quite enjoys the development side and I'm quite passionate about it, I want to take up that managing director role. But when it comes to actually managing the assets once they've been tenanted, I have absolutely no interest, no passion, don't want to know about it. Um, 
so I'll, I'll pick up a shareholder role because although I don't want to hear about it, it's a big part of my business and I still need to be uh, concentrating on the major factors and um, KPIs in that part of the business. So it's still a key area, but it means that I'm not leading, I'm not operational from the front. So again, understanding that part of things is, is really, really key. Okay, with social distancing measures in place, are you worried about HMO future? Um, yeah, that, I think that's a great point. Next slide is up. To do through the true costs that ha occur in a deal. So when you hear headline numbers, if someone's selling you an investment, they're often going to talk about headline numbers. They're going to talk about purchase price. They're going to talk about the gross yields. Uh, they might even attempt to uh, explain what their, their idea of a net yield is going to be. Now, it's important that you understand all these costs that come into a deal. Quasi, uh, can you um, just go back one slide? Yep, done. Uh, I think it's, yeah, there we go. Okay, so here's an example of a property investment that's being sold. And it's a 7% gross yielding property. So on the face of it, it sounds fantastic. Priced at £250,000 and it yields 7%. So let's run through those costs. First one, we've got stamp duty because we're buying it through a limited company because we want to avoid um, in the Section 24 interest uh, relief issue. So stamp duty, we pay us 10000 We're going to pay legal fees and, and disbursement of 1500 That brings our purchase costs up to just over 261000 we're going to pay legal fees, okay, for our lender because we're buying with a mortgage. Included in, or well, not included in that, is personal guarantee advice. So we need to, to do what's called uh, an indemnity policy uh, to show our lender that we understand what is involved by giving a personal guarantee on that limited company's mortgage. And of course, we've got to pay for that. And we're going to get a mortgage of 75%, which is 187500 We've also got to pay other professional fees like broker fees, valuation fees. We'll have arrangement fees that will be added to the loan of one and a half percent. So all this builds up and it actually makes that loan 193,000. So if we're looking at an interest rate here of 3.8 percent, which is fairly standard at the moment, you might get a little bit cheaper, a little bit more, depending on what the product is. Um, you're looking at paying interest rate every every uh every um sorry we've got a, someone saying they can only see quasi um hopefully i can just talk you through any of these costs anyway but just so saying probably because they pulled me to their screen because they should only be able to see the presentation oh right okay <laughs> you don't need to pin me it's okay sorry i'll carry on okay so Obviously, as this as we've got interest rate payments, so they're coming in at just over seven thousand, and the mortgage we're going to get, let's say it's a five year fix. So that means any costs associated with that mortgage, not just the interest, but they can be split over that five year period. So that's going to be the cost we're paying to the legal uh, valuation team, the broker fee, etc. So we can split that over five years, and that gives us a mortgage expense of £400 added to the annual interest payments. Uh, and that increases them up to £7,631 per year. So, Quasi, if we can hit to the next slide. So, already you can see there's quite a lot of these small costs that are starting to add up. So as it's a 7% yielding property, we know that that gross rent is going to be £17,500. Now, every, uh, every property is going to have voids. As we're starting to, um, to get tenants in, okay, we've got to market that property, we've got to attract tenants, we've got to show them around. That all takes time. Every, everyone, uh, when they leave a property, obviously your renters are unlikely to stay there forever. I think the average um, stay of a tenancy is just over four years. Obviously, for um, family homes, it's going to be longer. For one-bed flats, it's going to be a lot 
shorter HMOs is a hell of a lot shorter. Also, if your if your tenant type is young professionals, it's going to be shorter than if they're social tenants. So remember, every time we change a tenant over, there's likely going to be voids as maybe we've got to do some touch ups to the maintenance and things like that, uh, because where um, someone was happy to live there with a scuff on the wall. Now you're competing again with all the other properties that have come to market and maybe have been refurbed. So you might need to give it a lick of paint and that creates voids as well while you've got no one in there and you're still trying to, uh, you've still got to pay your fees. So we'll put in there voids of four weeks. It's a bit conservative, but it's always better be, to be conservative in these, uh, in these instances. Um, and then we've got maintenance fee as well because no matter what kind of property you have, you will likely be paying some form of maintenance, whether it's um, it's just fixing a door lock uh, that's gone a bit dodgy, whether it's giving something a lick of paint, uh, it could be a, a burn mark on a on a um, worktop, whatever it is, there's always going to be maintenance, okay? Things like gardening as well, and, and HMOs, all these sorts of things. So maintenance is going to be there at £300 a month. Um, and then we've got a market and tenant reference. OK, so if we say, for example, this property is a two year average tenant stay, every time we find a tenant, it's going to cost us to market it, to reference them. It's going to take time. Someone's going to be paid to do that. OK, so let's say that that's one hundred and fifty pounds uh, per year. Then we've got annual gas safety. It's 80 pounds a year. And obviously, we've got to insure the property as well. So that could be five hundred pounds a year. And then we've got that mortgage interest plus those setup fees we talked about. So that's just, just over seven and a half grand. And of course, because this is an investment, we don't want to manage it ourselves. So we want a professional managing agent to manage it. They're going to know what the ins and outs of all the um, legislation. I think there's a, something like just under 200 pieces of different legislation for landlords at the moment. So it's not something to take on lightheartedly. Definitely advise getting a decent management agent in there. And obviously, you've got to pay them plus VAT as well. And if you're an investment company, you won't be VAT registered. So that VAT is down the drain. Then you've got accountancy and bookkeeping fees. Because remember, you're buying this through a limited company. So if we assume that you've got four properties in that portfolio held within that company, you can apportion an amount of tax for that. Oh, I think uh, the screen's just gone. It's okay, let's keep going. Okay. I think I see here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so as I'm saying, we, we've got all a break away from our from our gross from our gross rent roll, which I think was seventeen thousand five hundred. Okay. So what that means is it's giving us a net return, okay, after all those costs of four thousand eight hundred and fifty four pounds, and that's before we've paid any tax. The total amount we borrowed on that mortgage was 193,000. Okay, the total of capital that we've had to put into that deal, so the total capital put in, not just from us, but from the mortgage company, 261,000. And the total amount of my capital personally that I've had to put in, the company's had to put in, is 74,000 pounds. So what can we see by that? The releasable equity, okay, assuming we've got, we're going to sell it and we have to pay an agent and we have to pay legal fees to sell it, that means our equity in there, once we've released it, once we've liquidated that asset, is just under 50 grand. So that gives us a net return after tax, because obviously, assuming we're a higher rate taxpayer, we're going to pay corporation tax and then a dividend tax at the higher rate. That gives us a net return then of £2,654, or if we're a lower rate taxpayer, 3637 So, Quasi, if we can move to the next slide. One of the big observations here is that all these small, all these small, um, uh, all these small um, little costs add up and they, they create huge... Uh, operational costs as well so what we can see some of the observations of uh, we need that property to increase in capital value by 10 percent for us just to be able to sell it and break even on a purely capital value basis so not including the rent so let's say we bought it we didn't tenant it we need the market to increase by 10 percent 
So that's a big chunk. So how long are we going to hold that for? Or if we are using that rent and we're living off that rent, I need that capital value to increase by 5% with that rent remaining the same over that five-year period to break even in terms of the money I put in. So five years to just break even. And that net return on the cash that I've spent on this investment is 3.5%. Okay? So 3.5% when I was sold this 7% yielding uh, property. So you can see it's an absolutely massive difference there. It's a really, really big difference as to what we were kind of sold. And actually, when you start to compare that, that net return after tax, when you start to compare that with other potential assets that you could have invested your money in post-tax, looking at ISAs, okay, what can you get in an ISA? What can you get in the stocks and shares, ISA, bonds, things like that, which are tax-free, well, it's likely you can probably be getting above 3.5%. The other thing we can notice is the net return on the asset value is just over 1%, and the return on investment is a slightly lower 1%. And our net return on releasable equity is five, just under 5.5%. But that's a little bit of a fraudulent um, observation because actually our equity is less than the equity we put in at, at that time. So something to just understand there is what is going to be that net return post-tax. So what I can see from that is that buying a property without maybe adding value or without adding value in some way means that I'm going to be stuck with that asset for a much longer period and I'm hoping on other things happening. I'm hoping on capital values rising and I'm hoping on rental values rising and I'm hoping on operational efficiencies to bring that down which of course you can do by increasing that amount of effort that we talked about at the beginning. So let's just talk about a different type of property then, maybe an HMO. Okay, we get a lot of people selling sort of the dream of HMOs and things like that at the moment. They sound high yielding, they sound great on paper at first glance, but let's have a look at an example and really delve into the cost. So again, same purchase costs and finance costs, but the experience and the cost of sales start to ramp up in an HMO. So 10% on a 250 grand property is £25,000. With HMO management, like Adam said before, you really need a specialist manager and they often charge more because there's a lot more work. If you've got a six bed HMO, that's six tenancies to manage, not just one. It's a lot more work for them, plus fat. So we've got that cost coming in at just over three thousand three hundred and twenty three because remember they're taking that off the gross rent tenant find is more because obviously we've got more tenants to find there's shorter tenancies young people don't want to live in a room for the rest of their lives they get partners they move in together they move around okay so again tenant find if we've got a six bed hmo that's going to shoot up in number because we're finding six tenants much more frequently okay so all that marketing has to be due and that in turn increases the voids along with higher rent. So remember the same amount of weeks, but we've got more voids coming along because that in turn creates more maintenance because we're competing at that top end of the professional market again. So again, we've got just under two grand of, of voids. We've got 900 pounds of maintenance because believe you me, when you've got six different people sharing communal spaces, they're not going to take as good a care of it as if it was, uh, if it was just their own. So again, to be aware of that. So crazy if we can get that next slide up, please. Operational costs here really, really do have a massive effect on the uh, net return. So as with that first example, it's exactly the same. All the costs are the same, except we've got a few extra. So one of the things we'll have is an alarm maintenance because we've got uh, over five people in there and it's licensed. We have to pay a license fee. So they normally last for five years and we'll divide that cost for five years so every month we'll be paying that will be th uh, 300 pounds then to that we have to pay cleaning fees because our young millennials who uh they 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 want the experience and that's what they're paying for so we'll, we'll be providing a cleaner that costs money and we're paying their utilities so gas electric and you better be sure that there is good quality internet or they're going to be on the phone all day long and obviously council tax now council tax is a 
is a separate issue here because now there's an issue where each room is sometimes being banded for its own council tax. But for this example, we'll just imagine that it's one single council tax payment. Again, as Lord, we are we are doing that. We are paying this. Again, if there's gardens, we're upkeeping that garden. We're paying their water, their TV license, their internet fee. So that gives us, at the end of all that, £961 pre-tax profit, okay, on a 10% yielding, gross yielding HMO asset. And again, 10% versus 7% obviously sounds a lot better, but when we look at those net costs, all, all else, all other things being equal, we can see that the first one was much better and that still wasn't very good. So, Kwesi, if we can hit to the next slide, let's let's have a few observations on this of what we can what we can understand from this. So apart from the obvious cash flow issue that this is a pretty rubbish uh, investment by, uh, by most people's standards, one thing is who on earth is going to purchase this property if once we've realised that this is no good for us and we want to get rid of it? Is it a good investment for anyone else? Is that going to be an ethical sale? What can you do? Maybe turning that to a single let might be better over the long run, but the cost to turn that it costs you something in maintenance and refurb costs. Okay. Then we've got holding and refinancing. If we've now got to refinance it after our five-year mortgage term, what's going to be the issue there? Okay. They, that valuer might not think it's as worth as much as it was before. So there could be an issue. We could be ending up having to plug that gap with equity. So some of the things we could do is we could reduce costs by putting more effort in managing it ourselves. Okay, we could try to increase rent without increasing associated stress or effort levels disproportionately. Not sure how we can do that. That could be a bit tricky. Okay, so these are things to understand when looking at this type of thing. Um, Quasi, if we can just get that next slide. So I've got a question here from Manti. So, but all those costs are related to the high-end HMOs for young professional class. If it's a slightly different HMO model, i.e. key or students, then costs are different. Absolutely. Costs will be different for workers, but again, you're still paying a lot of the same stuff there. So all the operational costs will be same. Uh, for social tenants, it might be different. Yes, definitely. But the rents might be there to reflect reflect that so again it's just understanding those costs associated with, with that tenant type that use class that location so now i want to do something where what we're looking at now is we're looking at something where we're going to add value okay and this could be like a development because what we've seen from those first two examples is that if without adding value it's going to take us quite a long time to get that net return and we're hoping we're putting for some increased capital value or increased rents and that that is what it says it's it's a hail mary it's it's hoping to those uh, those growth gods that something's going to happen there so let's have a look at something else our property source brought us uh, or sent us through an email it goes right okay you want to add value here's one this this has got 25 percent gross profit okay it's a small refurbishment project small development project and this way you can get uh, you can add value and there's a 25% gross profit. So let's understand the difference again between the gross profit here and the net profit. So same numbers really again. We're purchasing it for 250000 in a limited company. Okay. Purchase price is two fifty. The development, so that's the build cost. That's the refurb cost is, is going to be hundred k. So that gives us a GDV of £437,500. So we can see, oh, there's a decent margin there, yeah, over 137 grand. But then we've got our costs. So we've got the purchase cost, stamp, legals, that brings it up. Now we've got development finance because we can't just get a mortgage on something that we're trying to develop out and do heavy building works too. So we might have to get a bridging loan or development finance. Now, the development funder will normally fund up to 60% of the GDV or 70% of the purchase price, uh, as long, whichever is the, is the least. And they'll normally give you 100% of that bill cost, okay? So that development value. So that means we're getting 159 and a bit thousand purchase on the land, okay? So when we purchase that property, 
Okay, we can borrow 159,000 because remember the rest of it is pushed up into our build costs. So we can then borrow 100 grand on the build um, itself. So Kwesi, if you want to get to the next slide. So again, when we're looking at these loan yeah. amounts, when we're looking at these loan amounts, what we're going to see is what it says on paper we're getting and what we actually get in our bank accounts might be different things. Okay. So there are fees involved with this, this finance. We've got to pay a, a, a broker fee. So that's going to be 1%. Okay. We've got to pay a lender legal fee. Okay. Normally legal fees will be much higher with these lenders because they've got to work quickly. They're used to working fast. Normally there's an admin fee to pay. And again, we've got that independent legal advice to sign that PG because we're buying this through a company. It's a trading company here. We've got to get a valuation fee because that legal that lender wants what's called a red book valuation. They want to understand what it's worth now and what it's going to be worth after the works. OK, so that valuation costs more. That means we've got a total upfront cost of those costs of eight thousand three hundred. OK, and then we've got other fees. We've obviously got our interest fee from the initial loan to purchase it on a 12 month term. Let's say this is nine percent. The percentages, the interest rates are going to be much higher because it's seen as a much more risky loan. OK, so that's just over 14 grand. We've got application fees of one and a half percent of the entire loan. These can often be added to the loan or taken from that gross loan. So normally when the loan to cost is high, it will be taken from the gross. So that's another just under four grand. And then although on that purchase, you're borrowing just under 160 grand, what you actually get in your account is just over 140 grand because all these fees are taken off that gross loan to give you what's called the net loan or the net advance. So this means we need to come up with a total of just over 128,000 just for the purchase of that site. Kwesi, if you can go on to the next one, please. So we can always already see that 128 grand, right, we're putting in a lot more capital than maybe we might have thought at the beginning of this. So then we've assumed that this 100 grand for a bill cost, that'll include professional fees such as architect fees, bill control, structural engineers, party wall, contract administrators, various different surveys and things like that. So then we've also got our lender is lending in arrears. So what that means is they need us to add value to the site before they can lend any bill. So we need to maybe do the foundations. We might have to pay a deposit for materials and things like that before they can come and say, right, you have improved this value of the site. Now we can lend you a little bit more. OK, so what what's happening there? The lender is lending in the arrears. So payments need are needed in our cash flow to fund those upfront fees. For example, our architect fees, getting materials to site, all these surveys, etc. So let's hold 10 grand back that we're going to need which will be costed as the lender's not going to lend us that. So that's now 138,000 we're going to need up front. And these valuation fees from the lender, because they're checking our build maybe every month, that's going to be six lots of monthly visits from an independent valuer. OK, so that's more fees we've got to pay added to the loan. So as we're not going to take that whole 100 grand at once, the only good thing is we're not being charged that 9% of that whole loan amount, OK, because we're going to be taking it in tranches. We're going to, as, as the work happens, say we've done 20 grand of work, we'll be able to be lent 20 grand and the interest will be taken from the point at which we take it in most cases, OK? So, Kwesi, if you can go to the to the next slide, please. So, again, cost of the finance is starting to really ramp up a little bit, isn't it? Right, let's just wait for this uh, this next slide, and we can uh, and we can see what we're going to get as in terms of returns here. I think. Okay, so now we want to exit our legal um our sorry our loan facility so normally lenders will have in, a, in addition to the application fee or entrance fee there'll be an exit fee uh, it kind of resembles almost an early redemption fee think of it like that um and that's just under four grand 
and there'll usually be some other form of admin fee here too as well so that's 12 grand added to that loan now depending on the facility this could be taken off the development loan meaning you only net 100 grand that that 12 grand's taken off but it depends again on the loan to the gdv versus the loan to cost so that's going to be very different so we need to pay back in total 271,000 pounds okay and we have had to put in 138,000 pounds minus that 10 grand that we needed to put for the payment which was for our cash flow so that's going to eventually be reimbursed but it's really important to understand that you still need that a lot of people get really stuck on developments from the cash flow point of view so we can see here that our total cost now of this development is just over 400 grand Okay, so crazy again, if you can hit to the next slide. So 400 grand, remember what our GDV was, it was 437. So we can already see that that 25% margin is very, very different now in reality. So what we've got to see is we can, we need to sell. Uh, and obviously to sell it, there's going to be liquidation costs, we're going to have to pay uh, for marketing and dressing the flat, to make it look presentable. We're going to need to pay an agent to market it going to need to pay legal fees okay to sell it remember if your development you're splitting a home into three flats you're going to have to pay three lots of legal fees to sell each unit um then so that brings our liquidation cost to 14 grand okay so total costs now is 14 uh, 415 pounds so that gives us a pre-tax profit of 22 and a bit grand after corporation tax that's 18 and a half grand if you're a higher rate taxpayer, that's 12 and a half grand, okay? 12 and a half grand. If you're a lower rate taxpayer, 17 grand. So that gives us a pre-tax, um, uh, sorry, a, a post-tax profit of 5% off the GDV and a post-tax return on our cash employed of 9%, okay? So, Kwesi, if you can get the next slide. So, obviously, we can see that that post post post-tax return of nine percent that's of our cash employed so that's taking into consideration the risk we put in on the debt front as well so big observation there is even if the time frame okay and the development cost is bang on time remember we're dealing with builders here things are rarely on time things are rarely on budget okay so even if those things are on time and on budget all we need is for a fall in our end sale price of five percent to make a loss okay that doesn't mean we don't make money it means we actually owe money to our debt lender okay so just a five percent drop in the market can cause that so it's always really important to do a sensitivity analysis on your development what happens if time increases what happens if the bill cost increases what happens if the end values increases so obviously at the moment everyone's panicking about what are the end values in property okay what are the gdvs of property what can i sell my property for now if you're doing a development and you need to sell and you've only got a fixed amount of time to sell it can you afford to hold on are you going to go into penalties with your uh, lender so again it's understand that development is a risky business so don't just look at those headline numbers understand what the gross margin means nothing and it's all about the net return to you so again, what we can see is adding value did its bit, but what really killed this deal was actually the finance costs. So what we need here is for that margin, that gross margin needs to be way more than 25% for us to come in on the money here. Or what needs to happen is our finance costs reduce. And how can we do that? Well, we can do that one by um, reducing our debt and we can do that too by yeah, taking on equity change. instead of debt as well. Um, okay, so hopefully I think Kwesi's back. If we can get to the next slide, Kwesi. Yep, here. Yeah, so I think we've got another question here. Um, either way, single let HMO, this flat not looking very profitable deal. No, it's certainly not, is it? Um, and I guess it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're supplementing income, it's fine. Well, I don't know. I'd argue with that, Manti, because if you are trying to supplement income, you're putting in an amount of your capital, aren't you? 
route. So um, you're putting in that amount of capital. Now, what I'd be looking at is what can I get for that capital in terms of other assets out there? How can I utilize that money better where I'm not taking on any more risk or putting in any more effort than this investment opportunity? And that's what I want to look at it. I want to, I want to um, judge my investment. Uh, across asset classes okay uh buy and hold is still a good strategy this is develop and sell strategy won't apply to most of us well quite possibly but again the first two were buy and hold strategies and they didn't look too great again um so yeah again opportunity cost we've talked about that so again main, main observation um is even if the time frame of development of costs oh yeah sorry i think we've been through this Quasi, did we get? Did we have another slide, or was that it? No, that was it. That was fantastically okay. done. Bro. Okay. Well, I no. mean, just just to just finish on on that, really. So, what we can see from the first two issues, first two case studies, are that what we really needed there was to add value. Okay. On the second one, what we can see is we were adding value, but the thing that killed it was the fact that the margin was not big enough from the beginning. But also, the finance cost really killed us. So in different types of the market, it can often be opportunist to actually uh, substitute debt for equity, give up a bit of risk for that return, because those costs won't be as much, but you may benefit in equity. So it depends what you're after. But again, it's understanding how those operational costs of whether it's a development, whether it's a refurb, whether it's just a bog standard buy to let, buy and hold. There's lots of different costs involved and you need to understand them to understand how all that asset is performing. Okay, I'm done. Fantastic. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much, Fred. Hopefully everybody learned a lot from that. And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just put a quick link as well for the podcast that I, I, um, I host. Yep. So interested uh go on there we have all sorts of great guests on and adam's been on quasi has been on um it's, it's it we there's all sorts of different things we talk about tax lot we talk about structuring different types of uh of, of big businesses as well so go and check it out i would highly recommend that very much um apart from adam there are many other great guests so in the interest of time um mindful that it's 9 35 and i definitely want to do a q a we're going to have a long q a at the end um but in the interest of time i wanted to go over a couple of things uh in this section that i wisely came up with this great name it's called slow money nomics it's a bit like slow money and economics put together see what i did there i'm a genius anyway in this section I really want to just spend some time talking to you guys about some of the key things that I look at, research, use within my business, um, and kind of pulling in some of the knowledge that I have from outside within my professional career as well to put together basically some metrics, some key metrics that I review. So one of the things that I was looking at actually was the data that was published more recently from the OBR, Office of Budgetary Responsibility. They published some data um, quite recently on updates to existing Bank of England forecasts for 2020 based on what they'd seen. It's worth remembering the Bank of England forecast only came out in March. Yeah, beginning of March. So, that's not Bank of England government, uh, the Treasury, not Bank of England, Treasury forecast. So the Treasury forecast came out at the beginning of March, OBR have revised them, and I just wanted to go through some of the key things that were in a bit of that data and that analysis. Um, up until now, we all assume base rate was going to be at around 0.75%, which is incredibly low anyway. Office of Budget Responsibility on the left-hand side here, you'll see based on their forecast, they don't anticipate base rate going above 0.3 before 2025. So the OBR is an independent body that sits within government. They have the same access, to, they have access to the same data that the Treasury does, but they tend to often come up with totally different um, analysis. So I always find it interesting just looking at the delta between the two. And hopefully some of that is in these graphs. Um, 
So yeah, but interest rates to stay as low as they are. I've heard some people projecting and predicting that interest rates are going to go up in the near term. I find that hard to see the scenario where that happens. I think the other thing to look at is the oil price. So Bank of England were making all the assessments around um, GDP, around all of the revenue based on an oil price being at around 40, averaging around $40 a barrel for the next five years or so at the drop from 50. As we know, <laughs> oil has been having fun more recently. It dropped well below 50. It went negative in the futures market for a piece. Brent crude, the physical stuff has still been falling and it's still quite low. We're probably going to look at oil. So actually, and this was what's interesting, um, OBR projected before that it would fall to below 30, around about 25. But they did project that it will rise. Um, as demand comes back into the market. So I think that's an interesting, they, they project that it's going to fall massively um, in the long run. And in the long run, it's going to recover to be above the $40 a barrel that the Bank of England were initially projecting. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, the other one on here is around equities. So similarly, the Bank of England had projected a, a, specific, a, a specific growth rate um, within the equity space. They had thought that it was going to grow at around about four or five percent um, in a straight line. OBR have come in. I personally think a lot of this is still optimistic. The FTSE is actually, I think, above this projection at the moment, but I foresee that we have a very strong likelihood of another negative downturn or negative outcome happening as a result of this crisis. And I want to pull that up in a bit in, in this graph here. So sticking with the same trend, we have the forecast from the um, Treasury in their budget in April, in March, versus the OBR projection. And this is the budget deficit. I, this one was interesting to me because for a long time, for about a decade, we've been told that the deficit was the most important thing to anybody. And was the whole point of us austerity was to not only reduce the deficit but to get rid of the deficit so we were in a surplus the deficit is basically how much we spend more than we earn and it rose as high as 10 percent or 11 percent this was back in 2008 after the post-financial crisis and people thought that was pretty bad um, Osborne implemented austerity in order to get us to a non-deficit situation. We never actually arrived at that. As you see, we were running at about 2% deficit last year, started to rise again this year before COVID. But with all of the spending and all of the um, reduction in GDP, I think we're going to see what the, actually, what the OBR are forecasting is the deficit to rise to something like 13.5%. So this is going to be the gap between how much we're spending as a country and how much we have coming in. That's important. And I'll go on to the next slide as well, as I explain why that's important. Um, in light, similarly, unemployment is another key one because we've been trending at something like 3% unemployment for a really long time, which is a good steady figure. The forecast was for it to be around similar. Now the Office of Budget Responsibility think we're going to get unemployment at about 10%. That's huge. Um, it never arrived at that figure during the financial crisis or even close to that figure during the financial crisis. So unemployment um, mixed with the budget deficit that I mentioned earlier. And I think the key message across both of these is about demand. So whatever your business is, especially in property, if you need tenants, those tenants need jobs. It's about demand in the market. So whether or not there's demand for people and then the other, sorry, for um, jobs. And then the other element of the deficit is around taxation. So tax and spend. Governments spend and tax. In order to reduce the deficit, they have two options. Either they tax more or they spend less. The fact that the deficit is going to rise to uh, more than it was during the peak of the financial crisis when we were told it was so bad and so terrible and now it's going to be about 5% more than that. So it's going to be interesting how they overcome that and what measures they implement to get us back on track in terms of where we want to be. I think just as I close this off, the, the key points to note is that all of this is really, I'm making a few assumptions. 
one of those is that the UK is going to avoid any arrangement that leads to a no deal outcome at the end of 2020 transition. Notice I said that and I still didn't mention the B word. That was one of my goals today. Don't mention the B word and I haven't. But I'm making the assumption that we're not going to get a hard anything, boiled eggs or any other. We're not going to get anything hard at the end of 2020. I think with everything that's happened now, if that was to happen, all bets would be out the window. I think even if that wasn't a possibility of that happening, all bets would be out the window. Um, I also think that the government spending, all of the spending the government have been doing so far is very good for the economy. It's, you know, should contribute significantly towards us um, not falling off a cliff, let's call it. And I'm really pleased that the government were able to act so quickly and so decisively um, in, in this in this particular instance. So that was very good. Um, some of the key risks that I think everybody should certainly be aware of, a lot of the risk, if I look at COVID and I look at where we are now, a lot of the risk actually on the downside, I think all of the, the best, a lot of the good things have already happened or, or things have gone as well as can be expected, as some would say. So I think we are in a pretty good scenario. So there's a lot of downside risk as a result. Um, if we have to have lockdown for longer than intended, if the lockdown doesn't bring down the death rate, if we unlock the lockdown and it leads to a rise in the death rate again, um, if the mu virus mutates and we get a more uh, virulent strain that's, that, that is prevalent in society. So... Those are all the risks, but on that note, I think I'm actually quite optimistic. I think a lot of the measures to support businesses, as I said earlier, have been significant. A lot of the challenges around jobs in the short term have been addressed. It doesn't mean, as I mentioned, the risk earlier that none of that will change. It's limited the, the kind of long-term damage to the economy, and hopefully we are in a good place toward the end of this year, once we unlock, to have a lot of success as an economy because I, the, the opportunity really as i see it is that there is a fair degree of pent-up demand in this country in, in globally in fact there's a lot of pent-up demand um whether it's in the building sector where i know that a lot of a lot of uh, builders whether listed builders had shut down sites but actually what that meant was they didn't incur massive costs it's not like other businesses where retail side, consumer retail, where if you shut down your shop, you lose revenue. A lot of the builders actually shut down sites and saved money because they're not spending money um, keeping those sites active. And they're also able to open up those sites and unmask all those. Somebody's un unmuted themselves. Thank you. And yeah, so they can they can reopen up those sites um, when uh, as and when, once they put to, in place a lot of these social distancing measures to enable those sites to be fully operational and to work. The other thing, actually, is that I saw some data from Zoopla, which showed that um, although I, I knew from my personal example, if I look at spare room, the number of inquiries is massively down. But according to Zoopla, the number of people going online, so maybe not necessarily reaching out to the landlord, but searching online now that everybody's at home, it's massively up. And I have this theory that being locked away in your house for the best part of five weeks, six weeks today, will make everybody realize everything that they hate about their house. And as soon as we get unlocked, probably one of the first things that people are going to want to leave is their house. I also think the other, the second thing people are going to want to leave is their partner. But that's a whole other story. And I don't have a business in the marriage or relationship counseling space yet, but that's another story. I think once we get unlocked, everybody's going to be looking at all the challenges, all of the cracks, all of the squeaky floorboards in their house. And they're going to be looking very quickly to either refurbish or move or buy. Likewise, people, I know, for example, there are people who moved back into home and because of lockdown, tenants, people who were renting, basically put the keys in the landlord letterbox on the Tuesday morning. Um, a lot of them might want to come back out now that they've been at home with their parents for five weeks and they haven't done that since they were 18. So I think... And then uh, to my earlier point, Zoopla said that the number of uh, people visiting their sites and searching for rental inquiries is actually up during the lockdown. So that's that's all part of the pent-up demand and the opportunity as I see it. I think the key thing is that, the the other key thing is that inflation 
um, I expect inflation to be very low. And as a result, there should be um, a lot of long term benefit for people in terms of spending and purchasing power. So those two things together, I think, actually, despite all of the negativity that's around, there's some cause to be optimistic, especially when you look at property, you look at it as a supply demand equation. People always need somewhere to live. People don't really like living at home with their parents and people are going to be sick of where they're living right now because it's been five weeks on lockdown. And so we come to the question and answer session. Adam said something earlier on, um, which was really interesting. I thought of it. I, I didn't uh, mention it. Adam, if you're on, you said your favourite quote from Warren Buffett was? Exactly that one, Quasi. When It's the most pertinent one at the moment, isn't it? And we didn't plan this for the record. So you <laughs> didn't see this and you didn't know any, this was on the slide. That's right. But as it happens, it's also one of mine. Great <laughs> minds. Yeah, but to the point, you know, when the tide's out, as Warren Buffett said, you see who's swimming naked and right now the tide is probably about as far out as it's going to go so make hay while the sun shines and now we're going to go to the question and answer session so here's some i made earlier i know that there are some questions actually going on on the group chat some people have luckily gone in and put some questions in on the presenter app a lot there's a question here it says what is the outlook on valuations um you see and will and what will you see after lockdown Adam, do you want to have a crack at that one for us? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you can sort of split that into a few different categories, really. What are, what are valuers having to do at the moment? Some of them have just given up. The bigger the company, the more they've given up because they've just looked at the furlough scheme, looked at everything else and said, you know what, we'll just furlough the workers for the moment until everything sorts itself out. <laughs> Your small independent valuers who tend to be self-employed, um, small business owners, etc. I've been making much more of an effort, so I've I've heard tales. I haven't had any of ours do this, as I understand it, but heard tales of valuers who will go out in full hazmat suits if they need to go to a tenancy property. Um, they're still quite happy to go out to empty properties, of course, um, on the basis that they can observe social distancing and it can be it can be safe as long as they follow the recommendations around washing hands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, desktop valves are being used. Automated valuation models are being used. Important distinction being desktop val will be done by a human being, Rick Surveyor, who may take an AVM automated valuation into account. We'll also want to see um, pictures, um, evidence, floor plans, if you've got them, and ask a few questions. Um, so those sorts of things are all still going on. Some lenders are accepting them. Some lenders are taking the view that they'll take them up to sort of 60% loan to value and then They'll do the rest as and when things settle down. Um, difficulty for the valuers is if they do it by the book, which says, generally speaking, on a mortgage valuation, uh, everything within a quarter of a mile that's traded within the last three months is the most pertinent bit of data, then all of those transactions that have been struck were all struck pretty much in the world pre-corona. Um, so the lenders will be worried about how valid they necessarily are. And then you've got to look at, you know some of the figures being thrown around but in reality it will depend on an awful lot of things my, my personal theory is that higher end property actually may suffer a little bit more than it usually does this time around because it's the higher end where the furlough schemes and the grants haven't really touched the size it's one thing getting furloughed on two and a half grand a month if you're used to taking home three and a half grand and you're locked down and you can't spend it it's another thing being furloughed on two and a half if you're normally taking home 10 grand a month. Um, so I, I expect sort of upper middle class to be to be hit a bit more by this rather than try and sort of get at what's the whole of the UK doing. In a way, who cares? Because what you care about is what's happening in your target area, um, on your target properties or in your portfolio that you've already got at the time. So just a little caveat there to these sort of figures that get thrown around. How much is the drop? You know, we don't know just yet. But that's sort of what I know what is going on in the valuation world at the moment. Yeah, that's a great answer. And Rod, anything you want to add to that? Um, I mean, when you, it's a hard one, isn't it? Because when you're talking about kind of house prices and values, like, like Adam alluded to, you're, you're, you're talking about your specific area. Um, so 
a lot of this is going to be based on wages and the perceived uh, wages that are going to be coming in after this whole thing is over. And like Adam said, with the furlough, um, a lot of higher value stuff in the higher middle class areas, especially around in London, uh, people will be taking wage cuts rather than furloughing because their housing costs will be more, their wages will be more, um, and it just won't cut it. The uh, other side to that is that, again, like in 2008, house prices didn't really drop in London. It was values that dropped. And that's because these houses held lots of equity in them. Um, and what happened was people were not willing to crystallise any losses. So they just held on. Um, and I can see a lot of that happening as well. I see people were not willing to actually sell up unless they've got something else to go into. So it'll be more your second movers, your family homes. Um, and I think that will keep prices um, a, a bit higher. Um, in terms of valuations, it's a tricky one because you are at the mercy of the valuer. Uh, and I think Adam just made made great points on that in terms of how how they might act. Um, but I, I, yeah, there's, it's 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 tricky. It's very dependent on where you're going to be and what your product is, what your property is, um, in terms of what happens to it. I'm I'm not quite as a I think I've I've got I don't know if I'm quite as optimistic or whether I'm more pessimistic than you you on your comment on inflation. I think I I see a bit of de Rod, Rod, you're never you're never optimistic, mate. So it won't be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> see, see it. I've, I see a bit of um, I see a bit of deflation. Definitely, I see downward pressure on rents uh, because rents are based on people's wages, um, and with that comes investment as well. Um, so I do see some downward pressure on people's disposable incomes. Obviously, uh, what they can afford to pay, mortgage costs. If they're thinking of sizing up a new house and taking on a bigger mortgage, that could be affecting things. Um, but yeah, again. Uh, I do see a bit of stagflation coming in after that deflationary period. I don't really see inflation coming. I see stagflation. So what that means is the cost of things are going up. Um, but either way, stagflation or inflation, that's a good thing for uh, for property uh, for, for property owners of leveraged properties, um, as long as those interest rates don't go bonkers, which I can't really see them doing. So I think long term, all good. Short term, a little bit wobbly. Yeah, that's a great response as well. I think the only thing I'd add to that is that you, you both mentioned the area. People talk about valuations. I think it's going to be very location dependent. I don't believe in anything, any such thing as the property market because it's all regional. Property markets are regional and they're quite local. So to Rod's point, valuations in London irrespective i tend to find and i found this last time as well that in london most people tend to understand the equity they hold and are very keen to make a return you don't get very many um people who want to what is it what's the terminology desperate desperate sellers in london because they know the worst case scenario they can do a rent to rent keep hold of the asset and for some reason you perceive london house prices are only going up Whereas you can go somewhere else up north and it's a totally different dynamic. People might be more willing to sell because they don't see regular capital appreciation. So all of those two different factors will affect the valuations and all those different markets in very different ways. So, yeah, that would be my two pennies. Move on to the next question. Um, which one should I pick? What do you think is going to happen with prices? Uh, Rod? Yeah. Do you want to just repeat that question? What do you think is going to happen with prices in the near term? Um, again, depends what it is, where it is. Um, but I, th I, I see, I see prices coming down as people's uh, wages are going, and people sentiments down as well, things like that. Um, although there's going to be a bit of pent up demand from those that want to move, um, but I think no one's going to be paying over the odds for things. So I think short term, I think there might be a little bit of a drop. Um, certainly on, on, on those sort of things yeah. and I guess a question for you Adam in terms of I know that you, you have a lot of experience both on the management side as well as the 
buying signs. To, how do you think if we go come as we come out of lockdown? How do you think social distancing is going to affect the market on the management side? Yeah, it's really really good question. It's been it's been quite easy for um, some agencies to react. Again, I'll probably go back to my comment around valuers and the, the bigger corporates and the smaller independents. Um, smaller independents have worked harder, into, which is what I'd expect from them, um, in order to get um, <clears throat> workarounds if they didn't already have them. They're also a bit more up on the tech normally than the, the corporates tending to use a lot of legacy software and all the rest of it. So um, in, a, in a marketplace that's already been struggling because obviously letting agencies have struggled um, because of the tenant fee ban apart from anything else, um, they've used this as a, a good opportunity to make the most of the furlough scheme, I think, really, and haven't been spending time, you know, thinking about what does business look like when we reopen, but social distancing is is here to stay as a reality for, what, six to 12 months, probably, um, as we sort of dance around the virus. So I think it, it varies massively. I think the most proactive agencies have done, um, have done very well, um, and it depends, as I say, on how much tech they were using in the first place. Um, what challenges are there for them on the letting side far fewer challenges in my view than on the sales side um, because sales is so much more about the people and all the rest of it with with inspections it's easy enough really to do them via a video call realistically or just to make sure somebody's out or they, they swap upstairs and downstairs over um, easy enough to do check-ins and checkouts just leave 72 hours make sure staff are protected either side. It's not really that tough to, to use your brain. Different in HMOs. Definitely different in HMOs in terms of the number of people that are always moving around and all the rest of it. Um, so I think the more operate, like Rob talked a lot about effort, and I'm, I'm very keen on his, his take on, you know, that is very much a, a good way to look at it. People talk about risk versus reward, but they don't talk about effort enough. Um, the more effort you have to put in, um, so HMO, more effort, SA, more effort on top of that. Um, the more social distancing challenges you've got to deal with. One of the challenges around SA is obviously going to be just are people moving around as much as they were for work, um, which is another another question. But hopefully that, that provides a couple of insights. Very good one. Very good one. Um, next question. So it says, what do you think will happen to accessing finance post-corona crisis? I think I will start this off and then I'll hand over to Rod. Um, okay. I think what, for me, just looking from my vantage point, uh, from a finance perspective, there are there's a lot of finance around. I know within my purview, the government scheme, banks are tapping into the government scheme, which is going to provide 80% um, government um, guarantees on those. So therefore, they make it slightly easier to lend, although... This doesn't necessarily negate any risk management. But yeah, so there's a lot of liquidity, a lot of credit in the market. I think post-corona, there's still going to be a lot of cash in the market. Um, the real the real question is around, and also banks are very well capitalized, liquidity-wise, post-financial crisis. A lot of the regulatory changes that happen have meant that they're very solid. The real challenge will come not from the first order of impact of coronavirus, but from the second and third order as companies that may, may be already struggling before corona take a dose of that government hit of cash and stay in zombie state for a while, then eventually collapse. And then they're the ones that are actually just going to collapse because corona means that their business model is no longer viable because they can't do things like social distancing, as Adam was describing. So all of those things will lead to bankruptcies. It will lead to bankruptcies in the economy. It will lead to um, declines in that. And banks are really the backstop of the economy. This is the reason why they were bailed out, in fact. So when all of these things start to happen, the people that are going to face it are going to be the banks. They're the ones who are going to take the hits on the balance sheet. But these things will take maybe two or three years to come across. So post-corona, in the immediate term, it's not going to really impact credit, I don't think. In the long run, as some of the second and third order impacts start to hit, if it's not, like I said earlier, that a lot of the risk is to the downside. If we don't get the good case scenario and it goes downside, banks will suffer and therefore credit will suffer. And then that will have a knock-on impact on the rest of the market. What are your thoughts, Rod, as a developer? I think, I think you nailed, I nailed that. Um, I, completely, I completely agree with you. Um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find something else to add to it, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can. I mean, I would, I would just say that that lenders only get paid when they lend. Um, so if they're not lending, they're not making money. People, there's a lot of capital. They want to get it out the door. Um, but yeah, I thought you, you made some great points. Totally agree with it. Thank you, sir. I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, next question. Uh, I know that there are some people uh, who have submitted on the group chat, but I'm, I, f- I struggle to find the questions on there because there's so much going on. Okay, here, Deep, Sha, you've got a question. With regards to ensuite rooms being charged at council tax ban A and HMO, is there anything a developer can do in terms of design to avoid these charges? Uh, well, do you want to pick up on that one, Rod, and then... Yeah, um, I mean, the, the whole thing with council tax banding is not uh, about whether they've got or they've got kitchenettes. Um, it's actually uh, to do with something called hereditaments. Um, so it's it's not about the layout. It's not really about the design. It's more about the tenancy. Um, so the the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is you can maybe do something with the tenancy in regards to having everyone on one tenancy uh, but really it's it, it's a tricky one and it's just been a very poorly implemented system which is uh which if they had done it right they would have created a new ban for room sharers um because it's right that they should there should be some extra council tax because they provide more uh, more work for the council um but at the same time you've got uh, band A, so I, I would just make a note of putting, making sure there's clauses in your, uh, in your tenancy contract because you don't want to put something like uh, you will be paying their council tax in there because if they're a single person, they'll get single person's relief, okay, which you can't get. So what's easier for you to drop the uh, to drop the rent rather than actually paying them? And, and always the tenant is legally liable. So I just bear that in mind. Thank you for that. Um, Adam, you spoke about wanting, uh, waiting, sorry, for the bottom of the market. How do you do that? Isn't it difficult, isn't it a difficult time to time the market? I don't know who that's from, but question for you. Yeah, I think I think someone put in the chat, and I think they're right, it's a fool's errand to try and time the bottom. Um, but it's, it, I, I suppose, really what I'm trying to say is, and I've done this successfully in the past, I'm saying look for, but you know, predict where you think the bottom will be in terms of where the values will drop to. So is that 10%? Is that 20%? Back to my comments around what's the type of property? What's the area? What are the infrastructure? What was your long-term view on the capital growth of the area, et cetera, et cetera. And then just try to ensure you're not catching the falling knife. So Rod's examples are superb at drawing out what the difference is between what an agent might try to sell to you on paper as an investment property or a development or whatever. And then the reality when you break down all the costs that there are in there. Um, but what he doesn't do is he doesn't control for buying, buying well, buying at a discount, adding value, you know, the old, one of the oldest ad age, ad ages in the game, make your money on the way in. Um, so <laughs> I think it's a time to be even more keener than usual to try and make your money on the way. in. so if we go back to your B word that you avoided, I did five or six deals in, December 2018 and every single one of those deals was B word motivated and every single one of them had already priced in what would only be seen as the very worst nuclear no deal scenario in anticipation of the 31st of March 2019 as we know we didn't even leave till 31st of Jan 2020 Um, and so they were already taking the worst case scenario into account so it wasn't a case of me timing the bottom there it was a case of me saying that even if that was if the bottom was where I thought it might be, these would still be excellent purchases. You know, we're talking big, you know, 20, 40% discounted stuff. It's not the stuff that comes across my desk every day of the week by any stretch of the imagination. But it was a combination of, of a few factors, one of them being December, another one being aforementioned B word. So it's not necessarily the matter of, it's more looking at the set. What I was saying was follow the sentiment, see where the sentiment is, stick with your fundamentals keep buying well, protect your cash balances and your equity wherever you can. Um, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, pound cost averaging, buying a property a month if you're in a financial position to do so. Nothing at the moment would really stop me from doing that if I was in that, that position. And that's what that was my investment strategy. I just try and be a little bit sharper than that, really. 
Um, but the, there's no... Rod often says, and I, and I agree with him, the vast, vast majority of the time, there's no prizes for first movers um, or very few prizes for first movers. And a lot of people will say, you know, in, in the ideal, if we're looking at a standard cycle and there's absolutely no guarantee that we are because there's no guarantees of V-shaped recoveries, U-shaped recoveries, whatever. But if we're looking at a standard cycle, then traditionally what you would want to do is let it hit the bottom, see some evidence of it coming out of the bottom, and then start to act. So everybody exactly. else kind of got those very, very bottom of the market deals. But I don't worry too much about the what the rest of the market is doing because when I'm going into a transaction, 97% of the time I'm looking at holding it for a decent length of time. So I'd be more concerned at the moment with the exit to term financing or if I was using bridging, particularly if it was expensive bridging, um, I'd be much more concerned with that than trying to time the bottom. Who cares who times the bottom? Just buy stuff that you can look back in five years' time and say, I'm glad I added that to my portfolio. That's my philosophy pretty much. That's an amazing response. Amazing answer. Thank you very much for that. Rod, question for you. Um, when you are looking for investors and developers to work with you on your deals, what do you put in your in your investor pack? So I think the question is, regarding funding developments, as an investor, what do you want to see in an investor pack? And what would compel you to invest? Would you, for example, want all the costs detailed out sim similarly to how you've done in the case study, Rod? Or is there a different way that you'd look for it? I, I mean, I'd what I'd want to see... Um primarily is that they understand what the risks could be analysis on if things if build costs increase if time increases and if gdv reduces um that's my main thing as far as doing such a detailed appraisal i mean yeah you're going to want spreadsheets showing that well the bank will probably want them anyway um, but it, I'd give them the headline figures and then run through, um, then you can break down each section. So especially for developments, what they'll want to see are, it could be your professional fees and, and design team fees, um, things like that. But what what really, as, a, as if I was going to be investing in, in someone else's deal, the most one of the most important things for me to know is, okay, what happens if this, if this issue arises how will you deal with it how are you going to return my capital back to me not not bothered about the 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 return on the capital how are you yeah. going to get capital return back to me if things go wrong yeah. yeah return of capital as opposed to return yeah. on capital yeah so it's understanding what can possibly go wrong and then uh, cover the downside and then let the uh, upside be obvious it's another Warren Buffett yeah, classic very... there, return, return of investment before return on investment. And it's on. it's an absolute belter, as always, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Which most people don't even consider, do they? I think everybody's <laughs> always thinking about the return. They're not looking at the capital. How do you preserve? And it's really interesting. Yeah. From, a, from an investment banking perspective, that's actually the most important thing. The most important thing, like you don't mind taking a risk that's huge. As long as you actually hedged in terms of the return of capital, because well, you don't want to make a loss. Well, Kwesi, I think I think that you brought up a really good point there. I think it, it's very depend, it's very subjective. So, if I if I'm young, free, and single, and I'm 21, and I've got 200 quid in the bank, and that's it, and loads of energy, then I've not really got much to lose. Um, mm. Whereas if I'm coming to retirement and I've got a few million in the bank and I've got lots of dependents, then actually I do have something to lose. So your whole profile of what you're looking for from an investment is going to be very, very different. So I think a lot of people don't understand what they want from an investment a lot of the time in terms of where they are in life and things like that. The amount of times I've, I've spoken to people that maybe just because they're older feel that their risk tolerance should be, um, should be lower but actually it's yeah. what are they risking and they've got lots of energy to be doing things. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very subjective as to, as to what people are trying to get. Here's a question. I think someone touched on this earlier, but the question here says, what's your view on the CBI or bounce back loans? I've seen some education, property education companies um, suggesting that people utilize these loans to invest in property. What do you guys think of that? 
you want me to start on that one? I've got a couple of things to say about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's a it's a great follow on question from what we were just talking about because I, I saw Rod raise the point in a chat we had maybe six weeks ago. Um, ultimately, you're back to your return of investment than return on investment. And the thing is, if you're thinking about the the interest rates of two, three, five, seven percent, it's not necessarily the the chief point because the chief point is the capital's got to be paid back. So if you've got a business yeah. that's in trouble and is going to lose a couple of hundred grand that it's never going to get back because there isn't going to be this sort of ex- re expansion in demand after that's happened, then you don't care if you're paying three, five, or seven percent on it. You don't want the loan. Because the capital payback is the issue. Um, the people who have, exactly. the people with trading companies, and I use that phrase lightly. Um, I see a couple of comments coming in because people know I love to have a go at these guys. But trading companies, aka people who masquerade as property training companies, who are realistically sales and marketing companies, um, they are operating yeah. vehicles. They make their money from selling knowledge in inverted commas. Some of them good, some of them bad. Realistically. Um, none of them massively robust in my experience, realistically, apart from the odd, uh, apart from the, the, the odd one or two standouts in the industry, really. Um, so ultimately, if your stock in trade is being a trading company, you've got access to C bills a lot more easily than the sort of investment companies that, that Rod and I have been discussing there. If you're a developer um, and you have a regular pipeline and you've got a big development business, again, obviously, that's trading, not necessarily investment. Um, but if you are, then you should qualify for C-bills. The very thought of selling courses on how to get C-bills to people who've got two rent-to-rents um, or, or the, the usual sort of audience that they tend to speak to because they're looking for people who are early on in the journey who will part with a decent sum of money in order to, to, to further their knowledge. It just seems to me to be one of the, one of the poorer things that they've been involved in over the whole the whole deal because C bills would be available to you if you make a million pound a year margin from selling smoke to people. Um, but ultimately it's not going to be available to you if you've got two or three rent to rents or arguably even twenty or thirty rent to rents unless you've got two or three years solid audited accounts. Um, so I think they really should be should yeah. be putting should be putting that into context. And they shouldn't be telling people that these are probably going to be available because lots and lots of legitimate very um, experienced or long in the tooth businesses are struggling to get them and they're not getting them. So off the soapbox now. Exactly. Thanks for the rant. No one will ever talk to me again. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I, 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 just, I think it's so true though. You make the point uh, before, just before you get onto it, Rod, that um, a lot of people are thinking about the cash and not thinking about the long term. If you're not going to be around in two years, the fact that it's interest free or you don't, you, you don't pay it back for the first um, 12 months isn't going to help you. Because you're not going to be around to pay it back. Go on, Rod, your turn. I mean, I mean, forget all the FCA issues with all this, but the idea that someone is in financial trouble that they have to get this loan, and then yep. you're going to be using that loan, or you're um, you're even marketing the fact that they take that loan and put it into what is a high risk investment in someone else's deal you don't have control is just bonkers. Yeah. That's it. No, (laughs) it's true. Um, There's still so many people on the line. If anybody has a question you want to put to Rod and Adam, you can ask it after this question I'm about to ask. So as, as property people, we've seen a lot of changes in the tax space. I mentioned earlier that especially with the deficit that we have, one of the things that governments can do is reduce spending, which I don't really see happening given what the, the lack of demand um, that we've created. And the other option is to increase taxes. Um, so I just when you, how do you get see the tax in the property space kind of panning out? Because again, this is something that trainers probably don't talk about, that if you're coming in it now, it, it's very different to coming into property even two years ago, three years ago, before some of the tax changes came in. So... How do you guys see the changes in tax by to let evolving? Well, um, go on, Adam, you go. Uh, let, let me just get, get get that off my chest as well, Rod, and then because you've got a lot <laughs> of great great tax people appearing on the Rodcast um, and, and are having some great conversations at the moment. I would say a few things that have sort of become evident over the last few years. One of them is um, should you incorporate or not if you're in position to incorporate, you're holding enough assets in your personal name. 
usually is a really basic rule of thumb comes down to what you do with the money um and that that probably holds firm into the tax rules around property investment going forward so everything is all hunky dory normally until you're taking the money out to live on that's the point at which they start getting you and you you crystallize any gains um we we have a system which favors the wealthy ultimately as a capital gains tax rate vastly below the income tax rate um that that doesn't have to stay the same there have been times in the us where that's touched 40 percent um it seems unlikely to me with the conservative government but so do a lot of things have seemed unlikely and they've been done over the last few weeks and months um the, 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 oh, yeah. But the reality is that ultimately the incidence of tax, unfortunately, falls on the poor old POE payers, generally speaking. Um, that's where about two thirds of the take comes from, POE, national insurance, and then you've got VAT. So I can see them going after the big ones here. I think national insurance is going to go up. Um, and I think it's the one time where politically it's probably wise to do that, especially if they back that up with a, a pay rise to the nurses. I think people will not necessarily do the maths and... You know, an extra 30 billion raised and an extra 3 billion in pay may well leave 27 billion a year extra in the government coffers. I think that will have to go down to start with in order to stimulate, but then we'll maybe go up to 25%, which will hit us all, but makes rods that clever developing and 5% rates and all the rest of it. Um, the thing is, they can't, if they go after us, generally speaking, I remember looking at a, a paper after Section 24 came out and it was thought it would raise 800 million pounds a year. That was all. And it was also thought that the cost of implementing the system would be around about £800 million. Pounds. <laughs> so for the first few years, it wasn't <laughs> going to make any money. But these are not, yeah. you know, when you look at POA and stuff like you're talking hundreds of billions a year. So that's why something like IR35 is so much more important for them defending the tax take. Um, Rishi said one thing that I think worried a few of us, and that was ultimately the self-employed won't be able to pay less than the employed anymore. But our old friend, Mr. Gideon, yeah. George Osborne, put paid to that anyway, because in the old days, your dividends were at much lower rates than they are today. And realistically, even yeah. if you pay yourself tax efficiently, um, you're pretty much paying what you would if you're on POE anyway at certain points in the, the pay scale. But your, your own company does give you a lot more flexibility. So I'm not sure that they're going to target us specifically. I mean, I know Ricks have asked for stamp duty to be forgiven for some time. Will they want to put more on the additional dwellings tax? That's a danger. Will they want to use the annual tax on enveloped dwellings as a mechanism that's already in place to gather more money in a Jeremy Corbyn-style land tax grab? I mean, nothing's off the table at the moment, um, but I would not I would think they've, they've got hundreds of billions pounds hole to fill, not a few votes to win and a few billion to raise. So I think they're going to focus on the big stuff, first of all. That's my view. To your point, I think the bit that I noticed from Rishi was what he said about um, self-employed. So it was interesting that now the self-employed are getting benefits similar to um, what you wouldn't normally get as a self-employed person. And I think this will be the precursor for them to look at self-employed differently going forward. I also agree with you about um, NI, because that's universal. So that's a way to... Even self-employed people pay and I, who everybody pays and I, so that's a way to tackle everybody and say, actually, we're going to spread the burden. But Rod, your thoughts, anything property specific that you see? Yeah, I mean, well, I think I think it's just now more than ever is so vital to get the structure of how you're holding <coughs> property right um, for the long term, but also adaptable. Um, like Adam saying, nothing's off the cards. All sorts can happen. So if you... You're really, really tricky. Um, definitely, I think something could happen with that. I think um, SDLT over the last few years has been an absolute disaster. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if they uh, they try to do to do something um, something there, reduce that. Uh, and it just comes down to what they're trying to do in in the first instance, short term versus long term. And I do imagine that short term they're going to be trying to stimulate, whereas long term they're going to be trying to pay it all back. So. I think that gives you an idea as to as to where where things are going to go up. Okay, thank you. So, in the interest of time, is there anybody on the call that wants to ask a question? All you have to do is take yourself off mute and ask away right before we go. Good evening, gentlemen. I think you've done a phenomenal job. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Howard. Nice to hear you. 
No, it's a pleasure to be here and pleasure to be part of this. You're obviously beautiful people, and this is property porn at its finest. Uh, I love listening to all of you chat, and that's been that's been a constant for at least the last three or four years. Um, what opportunities do you find um, are going to be um, far more prevalent in a post B, post C? Uh, I don't know what we're allowed to say in this call, post B, post C kind of um, marketplace. I just, it'll be interesting to get all of your takes on that. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everything you guys have said so far. Thank you very much. So I guess I'll start and then I'll hand over to uh, Rod and then Adam. I think in, in, a, in, a post, in a post B world, one of the things I was envisaging is that the UK would be a lot more independent and a lot more, not necessarily able, but keen to do things on its own. It's interesting, and this is a point that links both of them together. So, to the point where a lot of them get re onsourced, reintegrated back in country. One of the things that companies noticed during COVID is that their supply chains were too fragmented. And if there was a problem in one re jurisdiction, it would hit their whole supply chain. So yeah, a lot of them are going to look at that. Actually, in fact, there's going to be, in a post-corona world, there's going to be regulation that forces companies to look at the sustainability of their supply chain, which means that a lot of that is going to be looked at and re-onsourced back into, into country. So, and I, and I was kind of expecting that to happen because of mm -hmm. disincentives from the government in a post-Brexit world to try to bring that in. So I definitely, I think those two things come together and I can see in, the post, in, in, in this new world we're coming to, it's going to be a lot more made in, made in Britain, a lot more things that are end-to-end -end made in Britain as opposed to now where you have fragmentation of the processes. So I think companies that already have that model where they do everything domestically will be somewhat resilient going forward. I do think that house builders, and from, a, from an equity perspective, I think the house builders are in a really good position, uh, personally. I think the house builders and developers are, they, they, the, the downside impact is somewhat limited on them, as I mentioned earlier, to, unlike some other sectors that are basically bankrupt for three months. Um, house builders, in a way, reserve, preserving cash during this period, as opposed to being able to tap into any support systems. So yeah, I think the house builders would do well in a post-corona world. Um, and I also think that companies that are domestic, so UK-based companies that um, sell mainly in the UK would do well. You guys? Cool, yeah, agree with that. Uh, I also think like FinTech is just blowing up here. The amount of grants and, and money going into that is great. And that, and that obviously comes back onto property because it's increasing wages in certain areas. Now, I, th I think I um, think a safe bet, and I think now in, in all these recessions, what what people want as investors are regularised and securitised income coming out of a recession, and there's no more security than government-backed schemes. So if you've got LHA tenants, social tenants, so I think there'll be a lot of money flowing into social housing uh, coming out of this. Um, so I think that's always always a safe bet for the next couple of years, definitely. I think, I think the, the contribution housing, that the government yeah. makes to social housing went up as well, didn't it? Yeah, well, that, I, think, I, think, I think the social housing is a good shout. I must say it's one of the things that's on my list very much. So LHA tenancies in general, I mm. see as um, an area where there might be a potential for growth, where there's been retreat in that sector for about the last five or six years for commercial reasons. And many, many more people on LHA slash UC, at least for the short term and probably for some of the medium term as well, if, if history is anything to go by. I think sort of post B, what, what are the things that, that I'm looking at? Um, definitely, I think social housing was already good and I think it's got much better. I think the other thing that I would point out would be work around um, areas where there's light industrial going up industrial parks because we're going to see more and more and more home delivery. Um, we're going to see more and more demand for housing around those sorts of areas while labour remains cheap and there's no real appetite to truly um, cap immigration because all of those targets have been, um, have been squashed pretty much. So areas, housing estates around um, some, of the, some of the Midlands, some of the, the, the south of the north spring to mind, but anywhere where there's significant sort of 
industrial development going on. And industrial development in itself, I think, it's had a good few years. But I think on the back of this, it's got a good few years left to run as well. So the other side of it as well, of course, is going to have to be commercial to resi, particularly retail to to resi or just repurposed retail. Um, I also think there might be a few office blocks not looking as good as they were pre-corona. And therefore, there might be a big opportunity for um, office to resi that hasn't really existed since PD came in because everybody's been kind of snapping them up a bit too keenly and probably overpaying for some of them realistically. So I think there's bucket loads of bucket loads of stuff. And I think there's similarly, I think there's a few couple of bits to stay away from. So that's my take, Jay. Thanks for the question. You're a beautiful man yourself, by the way. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Anybody else? I might have to wrap it up there, guys. Yeah, I think I was, I was, I was going to do the 8.30 thing, but since we have no more questions, you know, firstly, I want to thank Rod. Um, I want to thank Adam for your time. Both you guys have been awesome. We're going to have to do this again. I think we didn't have enough time to cover everything we wanted to cover. So happy to anytime, again, Gracie. Brilliant job. Brilliant job from you. Great, great strategic overview. Always love talking to both of you guys. And thanks to everyone for listening in as well. Thanks for the great questions. Exactly. Cheers, guys. All right, everybody, thank you. And I should say one thing. So, Rod Podcast, make sure you guys check out Rod's podcast. Yes, um, please. Check out Partners in Property as well. You can go to Facebook and look for Partners in Property. Check them out. They've got lots of great events that you should really be going to and signing up to. And you can Google the, uh, sorry, you can search them on Facebook, Rod Turner, Adam Lawrence. You'll find them there. It's been great. Thank you all very much. And we'll be in touch soon. Thank you. Thanks, Gracie. Thanks, everybody. Good night.